For you, the listeners of My JavaScript Story, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at LootCrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to, is it Johannes Schickling? Yes. I, I always I always want to say Johannes, and I, I'm like, I think he's German. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> so uh, do you want to just give a brief introduction to who you are? And uh, I'll just uh, put out there, too, that you were on episode 257 of JavaScript Jabber. came out April 11th, 2017, and we talked about GraphCool. Awesome. Yeah, totally. So I'm, I'm excited to, to be here again. Um, I'm Johannes Schickling. I'm the CEO and co-founder of GraphCool, which is a backend, which is a backend service. And we're now uh, also working a lot on, on Prisma, which I think we will also talk about during, during this episode. I spend most of my time in Berlin and will actually relocate to, to the Bay Area pretty soon. So, and in general, I'm, I'm very excited about all kinds of open source technologies. Um, which which makes me even more excited to be here today. Very cool. And GraphQL is an interesting technology, and we've seen quite an uptick in adoption with GraphQL. So um, I'm curious to see, yeah, how this all goes together with what's going on with GraphQL. But before we dive into that, um, let's go back to the very beginning. How did you get into programming? Oh wow, yeah, uh, <clears throat> that that's quite a while uh, a while ago. So <clears throat> so I, I I guess there there the multiple entry points for me there like uh one i've been like in general just always been fascinated by by technology and like sort of found my way from like le- playing with lego to lego mind mind storms uh, mind storms i think um so sort of like in the, in the first uh ways into programming this way but then really uh got got more into it from um actually me being <laughs> spending quite a lot of time when I was like 13 or something like that in online gaming that I I was like always part of like competitive um, tournaments and being part of clans, which needed websites. Mm. And I ended up being the the, the person who would build these websites. And at some point I was just like spending way more time on building these websites and always obsessing about making them nicer uh, compared to to actually um, playing myself. So, and then at some point, like other people just noticed that, asked me what I could do something for them. And so one thing kind of led to another, I got more and more away from designing myself versus building more and more complex things. Um, there's so, therefore sort of like went from PHP, um, together with HTML, CSS, dived a bit more into JavaScript was done, uh, was then like sort of what must've been like early 2010 um gotten uh really really got started with building single page apps like that was like back pre backbone 1.0 i think oh, wow. um and <laughs> i remember like, those days so yeah so this was like when when require js was just barely a thing uh and was basically spending most of my hours just fighting circular dependencies and wrapping my mind around this where like pretty much everybody on stack Over, overflow said like don't do this single page application thing. Nobody will ever adopt that. That's not going to be a thing. <laughs> um, and and I, I sort of took the leap of faith there um, and stuck with it. And then sort of like uh, also decided to like not render it uh, server side, but actually uh, deploy it on, on S3 and like build a REST API back then in PHP. Then sort of like made my way through through Rails over to to node ecosystem at some point hopped like then um so th- that was still all self-taught at some point i then studied computer science uh, at math 
So we spent quite a bit of time on on like Haskell, Rust. Uh, ultimately, I also spent a lot of time on mobile development, and then found my way back into into full stack. That that sort of like the, describes sort of like the last decade of, of programming for me. That makes sense. It's it's funny how many people I've talked to that, yeah, they're like, well, I got into gaming and I joined this clan and they needed a webmaster. And now here I am doing professional web development years, years later. Yep, that's definitely not, not, the, not the first time I've also heard this from other people. Um, you know, the, more, the broader case of that is, is uh, you know, I was in a position where, you know, such and such a group needed web, uh, you know, needed a website. And so I built it for them. And, you know, a lot of folks, you know, I was working for a company and they, they needed a website. And so, you know, they decided blah, blah, blah. And I was interested. So I was the one that wound up being saddled with it. And, you know, and so, yeah, there, there, it's a very, very common story, I think. Um, and you can even broaden it out from there to, well, I was an entrepreneur and tried to build this thing. And now I'm a full-time developer. But it, yeah, I, I think that, that is definitely also... That that's also a parallel story that actually fed into this. That I was just like getting more and more involved in, like, uh, for example, hosting my own events. Since I'm also since I was also spending a lot of time there, like as a DJ, uh, uh -huh. where where was um where, where I also like started my uh my my own side business this way. So there there were a lot of lot lot of different things that that pulled me in. Where where all of this was the the common denominator. So that that that's quite interesting. Well, and I also think it speaks to the fact that we all, we all, or well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't generalize too much, but at the same time, um, most of the people I talk to, there's some aspect of, I had a problem, I solved a problem. And once I conquered it, I felt really good about it. That keeps people coming back to programming. And when they lose that at a job, they tend to move on. And so it, it, there's, there's some aspect of human nature. I don't know that everybody has it everywhere, but you know, certain people have it to a certain degree that that keeps them in programming and keeps them excited about being part of the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there are just like bonus points there or like uh, additional factors that make you just more attracted to it. So, for example, I always like really enjoyed math and physics and so on. And just programming was just like such a nice medium to to express that and make that really tangible. Uh, so that, that was always like a big point for me as well. Yeah. Well, and it's funny too, that you bring that up. It's like, oh, I was always good at math and physics. And so, um, you know, that applies, but again, I mean, different people have different backgrounds and I've talked to a number of people where it was like, you know what? I was doing art and then I got into design and then <laughs> I realized that I could make my design functional and that's, that's where they're in yep. for. And so uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating just to see the breadth of, of experience across the programming community. right right what what i've also seen a lot is like actually architects going into programming or into into web development because like for 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 architects the feed like the feedback cycles are so long that they just like get fed up that like whatever they come up with either never gets really implemented in the real world uh and that they just get way more uh like the the, the feedback cycle and therefore the reward is way uh way shorter um, which really draws them into web development um, where they can build something and actually people can use it. They can iterate on it, which I think is also a, a very common theme. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, you kind of talked your way around to web development and JavaScript. Um, but but at what point did you become a, a JavaScript developer? Like, how, how did you find JavaScript? Was it just in the course of doing web development or was there something else that kind of pushed you that way? I think the first website I've probably built, I think it was like pre Dreamweaver. I think it was like was Microsoft front page, <laughs> which was crazy. Um, so and then sort of like then I got like more and more familiar with this uh, with with HTML and CSS and JavaScript back then. Like like JavaScript was super super uncommon back then, and it was uh, very very unusual that you would use JavaScript to just manipulate what, what's going on. And this is where I found my way, and, and this is where I had at some point this mental switch that JavaScript should actually be the thing that builds the website for me, and not the other way around. <clears throat> and so I, I sort of had like this very uh, typical um, journey there from like 
um, just doing everything manually at some point, using new tools, then uh, moving over to, to jQuery, um, moving over to Backbone, moving over to Angular 1, moving over to uh, React. <coughs> and I'm still, still a big React believer. Um, yeah, that, that, that was sort of my, my journey. I, I skipped Ember, and I'm, not, uh, and I'm still very happy with React. But I can understand that people have like uh, see a lot of appeal um, from Vue, but uh, and all of that just describes really the the, the front end angle to this. So um, and and uh, on the back end side, I'm not that um, strongly tied to 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 Node. Um, there, I'm typically picking whatever's best for the job. So whether that's being Go or Rust or uh, like Ruby back in the days. So that that, that sort of describes this angle. I was going to say, in my experience, that's Rails. And then, uh, you know, I was going to give like a self-deprecating chuckle or something. But anyway, um, <laughs> cause I've been doing Rails forever and I, I love it. But yeah, you know, it wh whatever fits your mental paradigm of the problem you're solving and, you know, makes sense, you know, if it'll get the job done. I, I think a lot of times we get caught up in the the whole ecosystem where it's, Okay, well, I don't, I don't see why you'd use anything but Node for your the back end of your app. And well, it turns out that you can do it with all kinds of different things. And if it makes you happy, I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, stick with it. So yeah, so Rust or Go, that's interesting. I typically I'll hear Go sometimes, but I don't typically hear Rust for a back end. So I, I would say like Rust, not as much for web development yet, even though I was like very, um, I was always very intrigued by, by Rust just because it's a beautiful language. It's probably a bit too like heavy handed um, since you have to think about memory management quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's like a completely different um, memory management model uh, like, like you would use, be used to from, from C or C++ or, or some other languages. Um, but yeah. it's still like, it's, it's surprising that actually, so Steve, like one of the Steve, he, he was very, very big in the, in the Ruby community and now he's moved over to, um, to, to Rust. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of Ruby, uh, Ruby is moving over to Rust because it's very expressive. I just think that the ecosystem is not fully there yet. And there are like a lot of experiments also to actually bring Rust to, uh, to the front end JavaScript ecosystem. So, um, uh -huh. so I think, I think, uh, what, what you'll probably see over the next couple of years is really like, uh, more and more a, um, uh, like the, the polyglot systems just get more and more natural and the tooling will improve with things like Webpack supporting, uh, web assembly. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that will, and it will be a matter of time on like when that will open, uh, a like, uh, doors for, for embracing polyglot systems more. Yeah, I think we're seeing the first uh, real systems being built on something that compiles to WebAssembly and actually works in any of the browsers. And I agree, you know, over the next few years, having a target like Web WebAssembly that gives you more flexibility than what you can compile to JavaScript proper, I think that's going to change the game in a lot of ways. And if you're if you like coding in a particular language on the back end, you're going to find some paradigm that is very similar. And syntax is very similar that will work on the front end that compiles neatly to WebAssembly. Um, I've seen some systems, you know, like I said, I've been in the Ruby community forever. There's a system out there called Opal that compiles to JavaScript, but it has a few quirky things because it compiles to JavaScript. And I think WebAssembly will help uh, uh, obviate a lot of those issues so that it just, you know, it's like you're, you're writing basically real Ruby and it'll just WebAssembly will make a lot of those issues go away. I don't know if it'll get rid of all of them, but it'll make it much more approachable. So I, I love the idea that you're putting forward where it's like, OK, well, this is a Rust app, front end and back end. Right, right. No, and, and I think there's a very interesting new component that people don't really see from this uh, abstraction yet. But I think besides the, the thought about uh, which programming language should I use, it's also like with things like microservices and functions as a service, um, systems are being broken up into so many different like smaller parts uh -huh. that makes it also easier to to move between languages uh, for different systems. And how you think about like ba back back in the days, you've been just thinking about like the, your big Rails uh, monolith, and you you sort of like slammed on new gems, whatever architectural challenge you would face. Um, 
but uh, I, I think nowadays you, you also have this new dimension you you, you think in, in terms of um, infrastructure components mm-hmm. you, you can leverage. So you have like what the, the entire ecosystem that AWS provides you, um, like where you would uh, I, I don't I don't fully know it anymore. Like what the the Rails equivalent was for for like message queues, but um, for in in AWS you can use Kinesis or SQS and so on. So that allows you to um, partially write a less uh, a lot less code and right. um, build these build these systems in a, in a different way, which I think is. Uh, is is a new way of thinking for for a lot of developers that that uh, just were used to building monolithic systems before. Yeah, I agree. Um, th- this is a show about you. I love getting your opinions, but I do want to get back to your story. So, what was it then that drew <laughs> you into doing um, JavaScript and, in particular, these single page apps? Because I I still talk to people that are resisting the the single page app movement. And I think I think there are reasons for that, and I think that some of the reasons are great, and some of the reasons don't really, you know, uh, pan out if you really dig into the reasons, you know, behind the reasons. But for you, what was it about single page apps right. that really appealed to you? Typically, try to when I'm starting a new project, I typically try to really well understand what are some if I'm making certain decisions, how long lasting are these decisions? Mm-hmm. So when I was starting with the with the Laravel system. Um, I was really um, facing this this long lasting decision um, on that that I maintain uh, the that I maintain the flexibility uh, on long term being able to switch out certain components without the need to refactor and rebuild everything. And this was already where like introducing certain layers of abstractions and good interfaces was a very appealing thought for me. Um, so this is where like the and I mean, this was really the the first big movement of separating from the front end from the back end. Um, so that that was a very natural thought for me, where it took the leap of faith, where this wasn't really a proven thing yet. Um, and uh, then, like, so th- this would have still meant that you you could just build everything front end uh, on, on the front end with jQuery, and you just make it less rich. Um, but the also the idea of um, a single page application for me made a lot of sense um, uh, from from that perspective that I want to build a rich uh, user experience and I was always sort of um, approaching every product that, that I've built uh, from a design first perspective um, and the the best way how I could really implement that is like I, I didn't want to create too much work for myself. And if I would would have needed that, if I would have needed to implement that with jQuery, that would have created a lot of work for me. So this is where why I took uh, took the step with, to to go with Backbone, and later uh, I saw Angular as a good step forward, and ultimately uh, went with React. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you mentioned you know a design first perspective, and yeah, I mean with these systems, if you're building a single page app. You don't even have to care what your back end is initially because you can build your entire interface without it and hard code some data in and see how it uh, interacts and then go from there. Exactly. But it, it was uh, still a very interesting uh, decision for me to face back then since there was like nobody who, like everybody who you would ask was basically saying, don't do single page applications. There was no, like, no positive reference yet of like where this is being done successfully. And you, you, you'd sort of like, um, try to 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 make sense of this on on your own. That this makes sense. Mm-hmm. So that that's, that there was a, a a very interesting uh, thought experiment which paid out. Uh, and for for me, it's like uh, I see the exact same thing right now happening with people moving from REST to GraphQL. That like yeah. uh, I mean, there, there you had one big success story, which was Facebook. Uh, yeah. But it was the same thing. Besides that, that like two two years ago, nobody was kind of like really sure whether that's the right thing to do or not and really now all of these success stories appear and it becomes clear for people that this is the right step yeah that totally makes sense so uh what have you done in javascript that you're really proud of okay so <laughs> i i think you, we, we we have to look at this from from like a uh from a year perspective oh gosh i, I for, from the backbone days i i don't even i, I don't even fully fully remember anymore I think there, there were like a couple of backbone plugins that I've written back then, or like before then, even a couple of uh, jQuery plugins. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I've always like there, there, there were always like a couple of missing spots that I tried to fill with, um, with, with some, with some libraries that I, that I've created along the way. Um, some, some of them I, uh, I, I made open source back then which where just now still, uh, get, get issues created for packages I've created like seven years ago. Uh, <laughs> it was like, so it brings up, uh, artifacts like. Uh, do you remember the days where you, you where you would use uh, Bower chess uh, as as package management? Yep. And like, it's, it's crazy how many people are still using all of that. Um, so yeah, but I, it I think works, some, right. Some... I mean, that's the idea, or at least for me, oh, that's, yeah. that's so, the idea. It works, and so yeah, why not? But some of the things that are more 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 recent and more more um, more, more recent that that I've created in the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, one of which uh, we've created last year, which was um, Chromeless. Uh, I'm not sure whether you've seen that. I, I think it was actually one of the fastest growing um, GitHub projects ever. I think over, over the, in the course of the first 24 or 48 hours, I think we uh, we got like 8,000 stars or something, um, <laughs> which was quite nice. Um, so what Chromeless basically uh, allows you to do is um, running integration tests um, in on, on AWS Lambda in a serverless environment, and um, what headless Chrome sort of allows you to do is run that in a in a headless environment. Um, and we figured out a way how we could run that on AWS Lambda, which means you can scale it out uh, in uh, horizontally. So that that's something I'm, I'm I'm really proud of since that saves saved us a ton of work, and um, and also, like, it seems like a ton of companies are adopting it at, at this point. Um, let, let me see. So I, I, I sort of really have to go to my uh, to, to my own GitHub profile to 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 really <laughs> <laughs> to, to really go go back in time what um, uh, what we sort of created. I mean, I mean, we're working on a lot of uh, on, on a lot of open source tooling. Um, at, at GraphQL, uh, and so all of that is, is uh, obviously very related to to GraphQL. Um, mm-hmm. So there, so some of the recent ones are like uh, GraphQL bindings or GraphQL Yoga, which is a really simple way to to create a GraphQL server. Um, so yeah. So um, one, one other one I think that's like still heavily used is like I've, I've written like a, a plugin once for for Gulp. Like the um, the the build system Gulp, and I think that that's sort of like still being like downloaded. Uh, I think a, a million times per per month or something like that, um, <laughs> which, which is crazy to to see like how the the peak of adoption is really like lags behind on like what sort of the um, when when people are excited about the technology. Yep. Yeah. Totally. So um, you, you've mentioned GraphQL a, a few times in GraphQL. Um, I think that's probably the thing that, at least when I talk to people, you're the best known for. Do you want to kind of give us just a brief uh, origin story of GraphQL, the uh, product, project? I, I don't know exactly how you think about it. So, Yeah, sure. So um, ba- basically the, 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 the origin story was that I was just... Uh, I, I just sold actually my my previous company where we've been building a VR camera app, and I was sort of responsible for for most of the the infrastructure and in building the actual app, and uh, I was also building a a backend there, and I was kind of frustrated that I was spending so much of my time sort of reinventing the wheel over and over again um, of building a backend that's kind of trivial but still needs like so much manual work like you need to write sql migrations you need to build like an api that maps your api to your database um, until you finally can get to the point where you can implement your your business logic and and work on the actual product Mm -hmm. um so i've been through that process like so many times i've been burned by the same things over and over again for example like uh, really falling in love with the API of an ORM uh, and ultimately just to realize that this ORM w- was a trap and doesn't uh, doesn't withstand uh, uh, doesn't doesn't withstand the, the 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 performance requirements of a production app and and so on so um, and and ultimately that just means that you um, 
that, that you have to do a lot of things manually. And this is where, um, so I, I just sold this company um, and finally had a lot of time again to, to look into new technologies and GraphQL was one of them. And GraphQL really, for me, showed the right abstraction of how you can build APIs and backends in a, in a better way. Um, so the, and then I was basically thinking of like, how can I make this technology? How can I build something for myself that makes it really easy for me to build these backends right. and also for, for other people and for like people that are freelancing, some of my friends. So, um, basically I sat down, uh, with a weekend build like the first, um, prototype of, of what later would become GraphQL, uh, a backend as a service, um, based on GraphQL. So, uh, then like started showing this to, to friends. Well, one of my friends actually told me, um, he, he built the same thing two months ago. So he just booked a plane ticket, uh, flew over to London where he was living back then. And, uh, th that's like ended up becoming my, my co-founder. And since then we've basically been working on this, um, to, together, like through, throughout the, the scope of like, uh, nine months or so kept working on it. Um, onboarded hundreds of developers to, <clears throat> to, to the platform, uh, had helped more and more people use it, um, until it really grew to the backend of the service, uh, that, that it's nowadays. Nice. So, uh, what are you working on now? Right. So we, we've had quite an exciting journey over, over the last year. We, we're always trying to, to listen to our, our customers and developers to see, um, what is, what makes their life harder than it needs to be? Where are some of the limitations that they're facing and how can we build a better system that, that improves that? So go, going back, for example, to this ORM analogy where I said that, um, that, you're, that you're falling victim to, 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 nice, uh, to, to, in, to the, the wrong promises of an ORM. Um, this is something where I think uh, an ORM provides to you a leaky abstraction. Um, and we're, we're always trying to like that the, abstractions that we provide to you are non-leaky and you can rely on them in the same way as react provides to you a non-leaky abstraction over the dom uh -huh. so i you have like um there are very very few cases where uh react is not powerful enough to let let you do with the dom what you want to do and it's the same way that we think about um backend development especially focused on uh, on the data layer so um and so gathered all of the user feedback that we that we had over um uh, over the last year um over the last year we've really um uh taken a huge step forward by refactoring a core part of the of graphql the the, the graphql backend and service um which is really this data mapping layer that maps a database to a graphql api so we we've extracted that core out and made it available as a standalone component that's called Prisma. And so that, that's what we've released, what, what we've open sourced at the beginning uh, of, of January. Um, and that, that's one of the core things that, that we are focusing on at the moment, with really the goal um, being that uh, we'll be supporting every kind of database there are, so that you get a GraphQL API for any kind of database. And eventually, actually, um, a GraphQL API in front of multiple databases at the same time. Um, and yeah, so with the with our big dream that you can use GraphQL uh, to talk to any kind of database. That's awesome. And I can tell you, I mean, I've I've tried using the the Ruby abstraction for uh, GraphQL, and it's kind of painful. <laughs> I'll just admit it, right? Because um, you know, it's essentially this other layer that was based, I think, on the um, Relay API setup. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, there's just, it doesn't feel native or, I, mm -hmm. I want to say it doesn't feel right, but that that's not exactly <laughs> what I mean. Um, in Ruby, it just, it, it's not natural. And so it, the, the way that those have been structured and the way that it, it works out, it just doesn't, yeah, it doesn't quite jive and so it's been kind of interesting to go oh okay well maybe something like prisma where it's hey look you know we're going to help you map over your database you know you're not going to have to do a bunch of extra work to you know resolve all the things to all the right place i mean that that's really really uh appealing to me 
Right. Yeah. So this is where we're basically trying to see, okay, when you're building a GraphQL server, where are you doing most of the, the, the work that like in a specific type of work that we call stupid monkey work? <laughs> so, ba- I love that. I think I'm going to keep like, it. <laughs> so ba- basically, um, like very manual mapping that, that you do from the database to an API, to an API uh, where whenever you change something, like you need to touch at least three kinds of files and you, you're almost guaranteed to make, make a mistake. Yep. I think everybody who's built a backend has, has been there. Um, and so we're, we're trying to like really make that part of building GraphQL servers super easy, the data mapping part, and getting you, like boosting you forward to the point where you just want to build, where we just want to implement your business logic, where you just want to implement your, like how, however, like your, your checkout process is built. Yeah, but the data mapping that you get a nice abstraction. So I always draw the comparison from like the same way as React provides to you a great abstraction over DOM. And um, nowadays, web developers don't need to learn all like the, the native DOM APIs anymore. You're using, you're learning the, the component model of React, or you're learning how Vue works. That just raises the the abstraction. And we think about the. Uh, working with databases and working with data in general in the same way that we are providing an abstraction layer that leverages GraphQL. That's really great. So um, it, it sounds like, you know, in a lot of ways, this could uh, kind of overtake GraphQL in adoption because, I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I'm i not one that always uses a, a platform as a service or, a, a you know, something like that, but I could definitely see the appeal of you know, something that can just connect to the database that I'm already using and make it work that way. Um, for example, front-end developers can still using the backend service to, to sort of get off the ground. But as they mature in terms of like how they how complex their the backend is that they're building, they can sort of move more to a component or uh, component-based architecture and still get the same benefits they got out of GraphQL. Yep, that's really cool. So the last part of this uh, show is picks. Do you have some things that you want to uh, shout out about? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android. And all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Um, so some of the things that, that, I'm, that I'm really excited about is just in general um, how Gatsby is just um, picking up so much, so much speed at the moment and uh, how easy it makes it to, to build static websites. And I think Gatsby is leveraging um, GraphQL in a really, really smart way that that you cannot just like say uh, in the same way as you as you're using um, like Jekyll that, that you can just say here are my static files and build my website from it. But with Gatsby, you can actually like use any kind of data source um, as as a mean to to build your static websites, which which I think is fantastic, um, and that really opens the door. For for other services like GraphCMS, for example, so that that's something I'm I'm super excited about. Um, also, from the GraphQL ecosystem, um, we're we're spending a bit of time right now um, preparing the the GraphQL Europe Europe conference, which will be in June this year in in Berlin. So uh, we're we're super excited to to have around 500 attendees this year, um, and. So, something else that we that we um, will announce also shortly is that we, we do a smaller conference also uh, in April in Amsterdam this year, 
uh, mm -hmm. which which is called GraphQL Day. Uh, we ha we have people over like Ken Wheeler, uh, who some of the, some of the folks of this uh, podcast might know, um, and like a speaker from from Apollo. Uh, so if if you're either in in Amsterdam in in April or in Berlin in June. Uh, definitely come come and see us at, at, at these conferences. Awesome. And if people want to follow you and see what you're working on uh, in particular, is there a good place for them to do that? Sure. So um, I, I think I'm I'm the most active on Twitter. Um, so you can just find me like uh, underscore Schickling, um, like just my, my, my last name, um, or uh, at Graphcool for Graphcool related things. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's the best way to to um, keep keep up to date. Or if you want to learn more about uh, about GraphQL in general, maybe just check out our blog. That, that's like blog.graphql. Awesome. Well, I'm going to jump in here with a few picks uh, of my own. Um, so the first pick I have, I don't even know what these things are called. I got it at uh, NG Atlanta, um, but it's one of those um, phone holder things that you glue to the back of your phone. And anyway, I'm I'm really really liking it. It it just makes it really easy for me to hold hold onto my phone. And so um, I'm gonna pick it. I, it. It's round and it kind of pops in and out. I'll I'll try and I don't know if you can hear me playing with it here right next to my mic. But anyway, so so those are nice and I've I've really been liking it. Um, and what's funny is is the part that had the company's logo on it popped out and I lost it in the airport on the way home. So I don't even know who gave it to me. <laughs> so go figure. <laughs> um, one other pick that I have, um, when I was at NG Atlanta, since I, I mentioned it before, um, I did interviews with a lot of the speakers and some of the sponsors and other folks uh, who were at the conference. And so um, if you're interested in that, if you go to devchat.tv slash YouTube, um, I have a playlist there of the NG Atlanta interviews. And we talked about all kinds of stuff. Um, the conference was somewhat diversity focused. And so some of the talks are, uh, or some of the people I talked to, I talked to mostly about Angular. So like I talked to Brad Green um, about what's coming up in Angular and things like that. And then I also talked to a number of people who were there talking about diversity. And so if you're interested in some of those conversations, um, yeah, anyway, some of them were really interesting. interesting. Um, and just to give you a little bit of flavor there, um, I'm I'm one of those people who, you know, I, I want to see everybody have an equal opportunity, but I'm not convinced that the ways that people approach diversity are necessarily uh, constructive. And so I tend to have a difference of opinion with most people regarding the topic. And so, um, you know, we, we came at that uh, with, with that perspective with a lot of these people that are very pro-diversity. And so um, all of the conversations were civil. I feel like we really came to understand each other better. And so I think these are more constructive conversations about, um, in particular, women in tech was most of the focus. Um, but there are other aspects of it as well that come up. And, um, you know, I, I think more conversations like that are what's called for if we really want to understand um, our tech community and what we can really do to make a difference. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to put those out there. Um, there's no like head to head arguing. It's really just kind of coming to understand one another. And I think that's what's important in a lot of this. So anyway, um, go check out those, uh, um, those videos if you're interested in Angular or in uh, diversity in tech. And uh, yeah, those are my picks. Uh, Johannes, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Um, I'm just going to encourage everybody to go check out Prisma. Is there a web page where people can go get more information? Uh, yeah, that's prismagraphql.com or just like Google Prisma uh, GitHub or Prisma GraphQL. Uh, I think you, 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 the, the, the GitHub repository is a good place to, to start our website. Um, yeah, there, there's also like a lot of people um, have created YouTube tutorials and, and YouTube videos explaining and like diving a bit into what Prisma is. So I, I think if you're, if, you're, if you're too lazy to get your hands dirty yourself, uh, this is like a good passive way to just kind of like get get a feeling for it until you're convinced yep makes sense all right well i'm gonna go ahead and uh wrap this up thank you for coming johannes oh, it was a pleasure to, you know, to be here 
bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.